welcome to another video and today I'm delighted to welcome back to the channel Mr. Richard McCook. Hi Richard, how are you doing? I'm well James and how are you in this awful afternoon on a Saturday? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. It's not too bad here in Wales. It's a sort of mixture of sun and hail showers. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yes, that's what it's doing here, but not too bad. Um, so yeah, today Richard and I are going to pay tribute really to Steve Harley, who passed away, um, was it last week now, I think, at the time of recording this video. And um, I know Steve Harley is a, an artist that you've been into for a long time, Richard. You've done uh, an album rankings video and you've talked about him a few times. Why don't you sort of kick us off and just you know tell us a little bit about Steve and how you got into him and you know, any background and then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll sort of chip in as in when I can, I can do so. Well, really, I got into him actually in the early to mid 80s. Now, I do remember Make Me Smile in the charts and I remember Judy Teen and Mr. Soft. And I especially remember Here Comes the Sun because my brother bought that single. And it's the first time I actually heard the song. So I heard Steve Harley's version before the Beatles, but I always loved Make Me Smile. Now, I did buy, if I can find it here, this was the first album I actually got, and I bet you, no, I do have it. Was that there? Oh, yes. I had that one, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got the no, mine's on the theme label, so I've never actually seen it on the normal EMI label. But I bought this, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant, and then the next one I bought was the Psychomoto, which I found in an indoor market. And really, um, of all the 70s albums... All my purchases were second hand, yeah. so they were. And the live album came next, and it was the live album that really made me want to buy the rest of the albums face to face because I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Covered mm. by Hip again, another one, but yeah, fantastic album. And um, you say we're going to be doing 10 of our favorite songs that aren't Make Me Smile. Well, I have to say that Make Me Smile, I think, is. The perfect pop single and would be probably in my top 10 singles ever by anybody mm. but we won't include that so um i started buying his albums really as they came out then in from 1992 on cd i think the first one was this yes you can and i'm not too sure if that's a bootleg cover because i've seen it in other covers but i've never seen it in shops and then the next one was uh poetic justice and he had two more he got back with, Caught Me Rebel Again with Quality of Mercy. And the last one was um, Stranger Comes to Town from 2010. So, no, it actually wasn't. His last one was actually uncovered, which was basically a covers album, which was released in 2020 around the time of the pandemic. Very good album. So, mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed them and one compilation i must say i got in the late 80s and this is before i managed to get the human menagerie album is this here now this is one of these i think it's the castle communications mr soft double album it's more or less got the most of the human menagerie album on it and those are the songs that really blew me away and i will say now the human menagerie is their debut album is my favourite of the lot. I mean, I got into it much, much later than you. I don't know what we're talking, maybe in the last 10 years or so. Uh, I picked up that Best Of record as well. And I wasn't too sure about it at first. I did I did kind of think, my first reaction, I remember thinking, why is he singing like that? Um, he sort of does this sort of strangulated kind of sound, doesn't he, with his voice. It's, it sounds like he's deliberately straining his throat. The thing is, if you listen to some of his other stuff and later on in his career, it's clear that he... He does know how to sing, you know, properly, so-called. So that voice, I think, which I think probably ultimately maybe was one of the reasons why he didn't finally cross over and become a sort of huge megastar. That voice uh, was a choice. I think it was a sort of artistic choice. And mm -hmm. um, I can hear shades of other singers. I mean, I think you've mentioned, haven't you, in the past, when he first started, we're looking at probably a bit of early Bowie, a bit of... Um, Brian Ferry. I mean, you think of Cockney Rebel, and I suppose you do think of the glam, you know, the glam era, don't you? And if you look at the cover of the first album, I don't know what he's dressed as there, that kind of lounge lizardy type thing, but probably even more kind of extreme, because you've got the kind of white face paint. Has he got white face paint? Or is he just maybe very, very pale? He wore strange outfits anyway. I think there's a bit of a Harlequin theme 
going on. I it took a little while to get into him, but then of course his records are are so easily found in charity shops. And it's one of these things where, I remember I found this record, which is his first solo album from 1978, I think, um, mm -hmm. Over With A Grin. I found this in a cardboard box full of just absolute tat in a, in a sort of junk shop, you know, for 50p. And um, Steve Harley, is, he's one of those artists whose fame, I suppose, was very concentrated in, a, a, in one particular period. We're talking 73, 74, inching into 75. And then something happened, didn't it? It, it, it kind of fell off a cliff for him a little bit. Although that album has got some good songs, that album is nearly the definition of bland. And yeah. I think that's what happened after the, the first Cockney Rebel uh crew sort of broke up and he got the next one in for the third album the edge i think was lost apart from the fantastic single make me smile and there's lots of really really good songs uh between 1975 and up to 78 it didn't have that arty feel the way the first two albums had and i think that's what really did Sort of, um, it's a little bit like Sparks as well, because Cockney Rebel, let's face it, was kind of, although influenced by glam, they were really that sort of post-glam, that section between the end of glam rock and the start of punk rock, you know, and Sparks for me were the same. And they fell off a cliff two years after they were successful as well in 76, although they did come back, but that's a different story. But I have another um, theory that I think hindered Steve Harley and I don't know whether you've noticed it or is it just me. I don't think he was very good at pronouncing his R's. <laughs> you could hear that. And, so, and every time I hear the odd song, I think of Only Fools and Horses and Crying. Do you remember the episode of that? Where your singer could not pronounce his R's. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Crying. And it's very, very reminiscent, uh, very obvious in some songs, sorry. One, the intro to Nothing is Sacred on a Timeless Flight when he says, are you ready, Ray? You're and ready, you think, Ray. oh, mm -hmm. right, yeah. And one song called Sweet Dreams from Psych Moto when he goes, uh, Dreams of Loretta, Lorraine and Louise. You can hear it as well. And I think that hindered him a little bit too. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's just me. Just to do a bit of history, when, when they first came on the scene, the band consisted of himself and a friend of his who he'd had for a while, I think, Jean-Paul Crocker, um, who maybe he used to do busking with. He was a, he was a busker, wasn't he, originally? I think they'd had a bit of prehistory. And then you had um, Stuart Elliott on drums, who was going to stay with him, Paul Jeffries on bass, and Milton Reem James. And then it was that lineup for two albums, and then <laughs> Milton Reem James, Paul Jeffries, and Jean Paul Crocker basically oh, Crocker. said that they wanted to start writing songs as well. And he just said, no, no way, this is my band, this is my outfit. So they took off in a huff and went and joined um, Bebop Deluxe for a while, or two of them did anyway. And then he formed a new band, called them Cockney Rebel, but this time it was Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. There was a very clear kind of like, right, from now on, we're going to make it absolutely clear. And of course, that's where the history of the song came from, Come Up and See Me, Make Me Smile was a song really about the fact that he'd felt abandoned by these other musicians who were just basically, you know, taken off and left him in the lurch. Um, but he seemed to he seemed to want to see his own name in spotlights. He seemed to want to be the star of the show, which is completely fair enough because he was an amazing songwriter and a great lyricist and you know, clearly had a huge amount of talent. But then I did wonder, I mean, he broke up the band in 70, was it 76? And as you said, this album and the one after, The Candidate, they sound to my ears like he's really trying to get into the American market. In fact, yeah. this album was recorded in America. He went to live in L.A. for a year, didn't he? And recorded it with American musicians. And I think you don't need to read too carefully between the lines to see that he was probably making a bid for international stardom on the American scene. And that never goes down well with British fans, does it? He lost his deal with EMI. And as a result of that, spent the rest of the 80s in the wilderness, didn't they, pretty much? He did, and I'm sure he was pretty hurt by the fact that he landed the role for Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. And then it was taken off him and given to Frank Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Crawford, we should say. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, Betty.
Uh, so <laughs> sure yeah. that really hurt his ego. But getting back to the hobo with a grin, I yeah. think his career followed quite sim similar to Mark Bolan, who actually plays on that album. I think it's uh, Mark Bolan's last yeah. uh, recorded session. Well, I think it's a the Brave he sing or plays guitar on. Mm -hmm. It's a good song. But, um, you know, he went off to America as well. Steve Took wanted to write songs. He says, no, bugger off, I'll get Mickey Finn in instead. I think a lot of the glam acts um, were trying to break America as well. Because Slade tried it as well in uh, 75 and or 76, and they came home with their tail between their legs. Yeah. And nobody was to know. He started to rock up his sound a little bit because the original version of Cockney Rebel, the thing that sort of made them stand out was that they had no electric guitar. So the sound yes. was based on the on the violin and this Rhodes piano, this electric piano, which did give them a very individual sound. And I think later on, um, in fact, there's, I think there's guitar on some of the later Cockney Rebel albums as well, isn't there? There's, there there's is. I think it's, it's only the first two with the original band. Yeah. Uh, that there was no guitars. Now there's rumours there was acoustic guitar, but I don't think there actually was. Yeah. So whenever he reformed them, obviously Jim Cregan was very good guitarist, played with Rod Stewart for many years, so he did. That's right, he did. Yeah. I mean, there's a great, there's, there's a really great guitar riff, isn't there, on uh, the Mad Mad Moonlight um, yeah. from The Best Years of Our Lives. So I guess what I'm saying is that he, I think he did, um, he did start to abandon the uniqueness of the sound and, and, and start to sort of stray into something maybe a little bit more generic and a bit more recognisable. But then in his later years, I mean, a couple of those albums that you showed, you know, the, you know, the later ones, he he seemed to sort of mature into this really, really great um, sort of acoustic songwriter, didn't he? Really, just really yeah. great mm -hmm. singer-songwriter songs, and he lost a lot of that kind of mannered delivery or. or the kind of you know the strange quirks and the strange ticks, and I think he he I think in later years, long after he'd lost his 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 mass audience, uh, I think he really did become a you know really exceptional songwriter. But it, I think by then it was definitely much more of a kind of middle of the road kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, I agree. And um, those later albums, I didn't I bought them really out of loyalty because as a fan, and yeah. I didn't really give them of a chance until it was four years ago four years my god since i did that ranking and before i did it i lived with those uh later albums just and they're actually really good you know i need to uh get myself familiar again with them some yeah. tracks have really stood out and one of them is actually going to be in my top 10 but they're not bad albums at all uh the last one the stranger comes to town maybe a little bit bland but mm. Yeah, they're pretty good. Right, so well, let's do so. The idea I had for this video was to do a top 10 Steve Harley favorite songs, but without mentioning Come Up and See Me, which clearly is his greatest song. But you know, he, he is one of those songwriters when you say to people, Steve Harley, that that is the song they know, and yeah. it you know, just it, it kind of gets a bit tiresome, I suppose. And it, I, just would, I just thought it would be nice to sort of you know try and showcase his other stuff. So if we each come up with a list of 10 and anybody watching who doesn't know Steve Harley's music, or you know, I've never really heard it, you're free to check out these songs. And, uh, you know, maybe that will help to spread the word a little bit. So um, mine are not in any particular order, very rough order. I've tried to put my favorite song at number one, but even that one could change on a different day to be fair. So do you want to go first and do your number 10? Right, my number 10, and I must say, I am not also going to include some of the other big hit singles, so there's okay. certain songs that you might have, but I've decided not to include some of them. My number 10 is actually from Poetic Justice, and it's the opener, uh, That's My Life in Your Hands. It's a, a lovely acoustic song, gorgeous melody, well played, it's mid-tempo, and the thing about this song is, it, you know, it actually... Whenever I bought the album, I couldn't stop playing this and I couldn't get any further than the first song because I loved it so much. And I just think it's a magnificent track. And it was co-written by Hugh Nicholson, whoever he is, because I don't know who he is. <laughs> well, I've got that CD in the post at the moment. It's winging its way to me. So I can't yeah. comment on that one, but I shall look forward to hearing it. OK, good choice. So I'm going to go for my first one. I'm going to get this one done because, like I said before, I do like this album and... Um, I think there are maybe three or four songs on it which are really excellent. I do like Someone's Coming, which I think was a single, wasn't it? Oh, um, 
it's almost got a sort of Philly soul sound to it. It's really, really, yeah. And Hot Youth, I like that. America the Brave, I like that. But I think this, I mean, I think there's one big standout track on this album that you can't really argue with, and that's Riding the Waves for Virginia Woolf, which is just an absolutely fantastic song. Um, I've no idea whether he used to play it live in his set. I'd be very surprised if he didn't, because it's very anthemic and very catchy. He's got a great feel to it. And I can just, I can really imagine it going down well in a big crowd of people. So, had to have that one. It is going to be the only song that I feature from this record, but I thought I should, I should have it in there. So, end of side one, riding the waves for Virginia Woolf. That's my first one. Good choice, James. And he also does it on that uncovered album, acoustic version. Ah, good. So they recorded it again. Well, my number nine is a song called Red is a Mean, Mean Colour. Now, it's a very laid back track from Timeless F Flight, but it's not that version I'm picking. I'm picking the live version from Face to Face, which I think is more expressive. The keyboards are fantastic. And I don't know what keyboard is that pheromone. I do not know, but it gives it a little bit more life. And especially in his uh, delivery, his vocal delivery, I think it's a brilliant song. This was the first version I actually heard. And it does beat the LP version for me. I think it's magnificent. So red is a mean, mean color. It's my number nine. Great track. Yeah. In fact, we should just give a little plug for this album because when 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 people do these videos of the greatest live albums ever this one never comes up does it and yet it is one of the great great live albums oh it is without a doubt you can really hear the crowd loving every minute can't you they're just singing yeah, exactly. along with just fantastic audience participation it's brilliant righto so my next one i can't show the records so you're gonna have to show it for me if you would if you don't mind it's from the prima donna album love is a prima donna prima donna prima donna so it's a ballad and it is Love Compared With You, uh, Love yeah. in brackets. And Steve Harley has done this a couple of times in his career. He's just written these really fantastic, almost sort of Elton John-like piano, just really wonderfully written ballads. And yeah. not something I think he would have done on his first couple of albums when he was still trying to be kind of, you know, edgy and boxy music and glam. But I think... It didn't take him all that long, a couple of years before he started to show that side to him. And I think that song is also on here, isn't it? It's also on the live album. It is, yes. And again, a fantastic <laughs> version of it. And mm -hmm. as soon as he starts to play it, the crowd erupts. And um, I think it's just a great example of how he was just a great balladeer. And he didn't necessarily always have to be lyrically obscure or strange or, you know, whatever, surreal. He could do something very sort of honest and just from his heart to yours. And I just think it's a fantastic song. So, yeah, Love Compared With You uh, from 76, I think, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say, I think Mr. Harley is looking down on you because of the only two songs that he covered on his own, of his own on that Uncovered album. Love That's Compared it. To You. Fantastic. Song. Yeah. There you go. So you picked both of them. Right, I mentioned Timeless Flight and my number seven, or sorry, number eight is from Timeless Flight and it's White White Dove, which um, was a single and it's a great little funky number, especially in the verses. It's got almost got like a sh chic like guitar. And did a little little yeah, it's really, really good. And the yeah. back and vocals are brilliant. And then it goes into this so the the chorus is so melodic and there's uh horns in there, but the horns are not sort of in your face. It's an absolutely brilliant single. It was the second single lifted off this. The first one was Black and White. Both of them filled the chart, but White White Dove for me definitely gets in. And that's my number eight. Yeah, I nearly, nearly chose that one because um, it is very funky. Well, I'm going to stick with that album for my next choice, uh, number eight. Um, it's the same colour as the tablecloth, so I couldn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> um from Timeless Flight, I'm going to go with the wonderful second to last song, Nothing Is Sacred, yeah. which uh, apparently was written about um, a trip that he'd made to the River Danube with a couple of friends. And I have poured over the lyrics to this song, trying to work out what the hell he's singing about, because it's a very strange lyric, isn't it? It references Michelangelo and uh, blood keeps coming into it for reasons that I can't quite work out. But I suspect it's probably a song just about him and his mates getting very, very stoned uh, in their younger days. And 
But musically, it almost reminds me of something from Astral Weeks or something, a kind of Van Morrison acoustic guitar and just very beautiful, soft, yeah. gorgeous, and just a very mysterious lyric, fantastic piece of songwriting. That was the first track off that album that drew me in, because I loved it. But my number seven, I think, is the precursor to Make Me Smile. And it's from uh, The Human Menagerie. Uh, it's a fantastic little quirky song with plenty of ooh la la's in it called Muriel the Actor. I absolutely yeah. love it. <laughs> it's really it is very similar in a way, and um, the thing about this is plenty of steel drums in it, which I always enjoy. So um, just a really catchy little number, probably the catchiest track off this, mm -hmm. and I think it could have been a single in its own right, but in a way I'm glad it wasn't, because I don't think Make Me Smile would ever have been released if something like this had been, because they are, I think, quite similar. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, whenever I heard it on that double compilation I showed earlier on, I had to get this album, so... Muriel the actor is my number seven. Yeah, this, I mean, this, these steel drums are not credited. I can only assume that it's Stuart Elliott playing them. In which case, he's a very he's a very clever and versatile chap, isn't he? Um, yeah. So I may have something to say about that one a bit later on. So I won't uh, I won't say anything now. <laughs> okay. So for my number seven, we are going to go with um, this album. Uh, the best years of our lives and uh it is track two uh the mad mad moonlight which is one of the more upbeat songs on the record really it bursts out of the gate after the introduction it started introducing the best years uh and then it just just comes out it was just all guns blazing really it's just a song that i just really enjoy you know it's just one of steve's most uh accessible upbeat happy kind of songs Love it. I think the Smiths actually took influence from that because mm. for The Queen is Dead, you got the Take Me Back to Dear Old Blighty going into The Queen is Dead. This one is, um, oh, but it's magic. It's the best years of our life. Do, 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 do. And then it goes into it. Interesting so, parallel. Um, that had not occurred yeah. to me. Well, my number six is also from Human Menagerie, and it's Loretta's Tale. And it is a very acoustic sounding uh, record. It's very, it's not slow, it's mid paced, but it is acoustic. There's no acoustic guitars on it. You think there is, it's just the way that the percussion and the bass and uh, so forth and the keyboards work together. You would swear there's acoustic guitar in it. And it's a really nice song. It's again, it's very melodic and it was on that double compilation album. And again, it reinforced the fact I had to buy this album. So Loretta's Tail gets my number six. Yeah, go absolutely gorgeous tune. Absolutely brilliant. Right over then. So for my number six, we're gonna do one that you've already had. And uh, I was very restrained at the time. I didn't mention anything because I knew it was coming up. Uh, so uh number six, I'm gonna go with um red is a mean mean colour, which apparently was a song about communism. I have no information to impart. Just apart from that, except I notice in "Nothing Is Sacred," he also he also references the Reds in that song as well. So, I think he, I think he'd been on a bit of a a travel odyssey to Eastern Europe, and I think for some reason this communist theme was in his mind. Um, so, just a really subtle, brilliant song. It's quite soft. Um, you know, it's not a loud song, is it? It's not a big rocker or anything. It's got like keyboard in it and uh it's, it's quite bluesy almost red is a meme in color is that the first time we've coincided it is but we will coincide again <laughs> no, no doubt yes yeah. no doubt. Doubt. <laughs> well my number five i showed the precursor to make me smile i think this is the natural follow-up make me smile and it's the title track of love's a prima donna with the doot doot doots and all the rest of it. Catchy, I think he is trying to rewrite Make Me Smile with this. And it was a hit, but not only number 41 in the charts, the big hit actually off this was Here Comes the Sun. But I think it's, again, very, very catchy. And to me, it's got a hit single written all over it. But because Make Me Smile was massive, I, it failed. But I still think it's one of his best ever singles i love it and it's my number five good choice uh, i nearly had it but um i it fell by the wayside at some point during one of my many lists i've made about 12 different versions of my list prior to making this <laughs> video 
Okay, so we're going to have another repeat now, and uh, we're going to go to um, the first album again. Uh, and um, the track that you mentioned not too long ago, Muriel the Actor with those steel drums. So yeah, very, very infectious. Uh, I, did, I almost thought about putting it at number one because it really does put a smile on my face every time I hear it. It's got a very joyous, bouncy kind of sound to it. And the Caribbean drum thing is just a stroke of genius. There's no particular reason to have it, I don't think. I don't think the lyric particularly has a kind of Caribbean flavour to it, but not enough pop songs with steel drums on them, so we give him plaudits for that. So, yeah, number five, Muriel, the actor from The Human Menagerie. Well, my number four is also a repeat, so it's been too long on it at all. And it is the, uh, the Madman Moonlight, the Mad Mad Moonlight with introducing the best years of our lives, opening it. Again, you said everything about it. I think it's just a really, really good track. I think a single material, but never was, and it's a fantastic opener to the album. Uh, that gets my number four. Right, so my number four, this nearly didn't get on the list, but then I had to put it on finally in the end. I'm going to go with the, the opening track, Hideaway. And uh, this one, I sort of see this one and Mirror Freak at the start of side two, almost as kind of like two different versions of the same song. They both are very dominated by that Rhodes piano and they both have this very sort of enigmatic, mysterious kind of quality to them. No idea what he's thinking about. Um, something sort of slightly uncanny, I think, about both of them. They just both have a strange, sort of almost sort of spooky kind of thing going on, don't they? I think it's that piano. I think it's very psychedelic, freaky out type song, a bit like Murray Freak. Well, my number three, and I'm going to cheat, James, and uh, as a fact, I'm cheating. And I'm picking two songs because I can't split them. And it's a bit like Brain Damage with Eclipse by Pink Floyd. You can't have one without the other. And in this case, it's Sweet Dreams going into Psychomoto, the first two tracks in the album. Now, Sweet Dreams is less than two minutes long. Love it the bits, even though he does struggle with dreaming of Loretta, Lurian and Louise. And then you get into what you think is a really good guitar riff, but it's not. It's that scratchy violin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a fantastic song, and his vocals are brilliant, the way he really goes high, and magnificent track. Now, the second song, Sekimoto, was on that greatest hits that you had, the very best of Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. But to me, the two of them have to come together, and whenever I do a CD, I uh, actually blend the two of them together as one track. So... For me, number three is Sweet Dreams Stroke Psychomoto from the Psychomoto album in 1974. Okay, so for my number three, we're going to do one that uh, you've already done, going back to The Human Menagerie again and Loretta's Tale. I love the catchiness of this one. I love the little keyboard refrain, you know, the da 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 It's almost got a sort of childlike quality to it, almost like a little nursery rhyme or something. There's a great sort of innocence about some of these early Cockney Rebel songs. A sort of blend of innocence with some strange sort of subversion going on under the surface because you can never quite work out what the words are about but the tunes are all quite sort of quite pleasant aren't they and quite accessible but there's definitely something slightly uncanny about them something slightly strange about them well my number two and this is my number two and it is and it isn't this track here the title track of the best years of our lives from this album, I don't really like. However, the live version mm. is absolutely amazing. Now, you mentioned about it earlier on, how the crowd participation really lifts this album. It's just Steve Harley and an acoustic guitar. There's a tiny little bit of per percussion just at the end of the song. Mm. But uh, this crowd are singing away. It makes the song brilliant now whenever i was a student uh years ago we're talking nearly 35 years ago my girlfriend at the time loved this song in particular and um, i must have been about four oh, well ever since i went on facebook she sent me a message saying is there any way you could get me an mp3 of that live version of best years of our lives which i was able to do and send it as a message then she got to see him live. She actually messaged me on Sunday to say that he had passed, you know, and, you know, she's married with kids and all the rest of it, but she has a love for Steve Harley as well, and the best years of her lives. I think it's her favourite song, and it's definitely one of mine. 
absolutely brilliant and it's always been my favorite off this album and it it knocks the studio version into touch for me mm. so that's my number two right so so for my number two this is a song which again is one of steve harley's sort of greatest songs really and it's one of these ones that the crowd always went mad to so the closing track on this tumbling down which just, you know, it just is an epic, isn't it? It's got epic written all over it. It's clearly written as an epic to be performed as an epic with a certain degree of epic, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sort of, you know, Zippo aloft waving. Um, I just think it works brilliantly, just the way that the arrangement just swells up behind him. And, uh, you know, what a great album closer. I was listening to it a while ago and thinking it's almost up there with, you know, Lack of the Gods Part 2. It's, it's, it's not quite as apocalyptic, but uh, I think Queen and Cockney Rebel, they did share a bit of the same kind of glammy, epic kind of quality. Well, I guess the other big one was Death Trip at the end of the first album, which again, which is even more huge and momentous, isn't it? Again, with the big orchestrations. Very good choice. But you stole my thunder, James. You stole my thunder. Because my number one is Death Trip. Nearly 10 minutes, about 9 minutes 50 in length it does start slow and you think it's not going anywhere but halfway through whenever the piano goes in it goes into really a classical piece yeah and then the choral section is great and then you know the uh, orchestral section comes in as well and then you can hear steve in the background singing away too and it all comes to like crescendo and goes back to the start again mm. I, I absolutely love it as the highlight of this album uh, it's like the last track on the album because I have the CD as well. Like it was a B-side came on after that, which didn't sound right. But Death Trip for me, absolutely brilliant. Nine minutes of genius. I kind of wish I put it in there now. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, I mean, my number one is a bit of a cop out in a way because it is one of his sort of pop masterpieces. Uh, you've had it already. Oh right, okay. It's the title track. Ah, uh, Segmodo. It almost reminds me of sort of early ELO in a way, almost like, you know, roll over Beethoven, the way that he's got the violins chugging along, doing what the rhythm guitar would normally be doing. And it's just so quirky and so individual. No idea what it's meant to be about. I mean, what the hell is the Psychomodo? Have you got any idea? Well, maybe he got inspiration from Quasimodo and has made up his own sort of character. The Psychomodo. Yeah, yeah. We should just say, you know, lyrically, he was definitely a genius, wasn't he? I mean, I think he was influenced by Bob Dylan. From what and, I read. And Mark Bowen as well. He was a huge fan of the mm. trans album, A Beard, a Beard of Stars. I remember him talking about that. Yeah. And saying it's one of the best LPs ever. He's a very, very individual and clever guy, I think. Underrated. Very underrated. And I think a big influence on Britpop as well. Like I've always said, Blur. Mm. I think take a lot from Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. The style. Especially from around that Mr. Soft. Judy Teen type yeah. era. Yeah. It's just that Damon Albarn could pronounce his R's, unfortunately. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what pushed him over the edge. Great stuff. Have you got anything else to add, Richard, or shall we? No, just just say it. it's another one gone. Yeah. It's back to life. You know, all these mm -hmm. pop stars that you grew up with whenever you were kids, you know, they're in their 70s now, and some of them are in their 80s. So it's just back to life. There some. Mm. Going to he was very, very into the live thing, we should just say. Even though his commercial career had nosedived, he never lost his fan base. And in terms of being a live band, I mean, they were still selling out the Royal Albert Hall, was it, in 2010 or 12 or something, still doing big shows. He, you know, he never lost the connection to the audience that he built up. I have to say as well, with Make Me Smile, you know, that song actually charted on about four or five different occasions. Mm. throughout the years okay number one in 1975 but it got top 30 again top 50 and every reissue it seemed to creep back into the charts yeah. so yeah. i think that's where he got a lot of his money from i mean he described the song as his baby and he, he you know he never he never stopped playing it he was one of these you know dickheads who do shows and refuse to play the big hits or anything he absolutely accepted that it was the you know, it was the song that brought him international prestige and, you know, won in this huge fan base. But, um, you know, it, I suppose it just would have been nice if more of his material had, had crossed over in that way. But um, I don't think he did too badly overall. Do let us know what you think. If you know Steve Harley's music already, let us know what your choices would be. If you don't know his music and you decide to check out those songs, also let us know what you thought of them. So 
That'll do for now. Thanks for joining me again, Richard. Great to see you again. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. No worries. And we'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh, to come up and see me, to make me